Um, hi, I'm Bill Petricelli, one of the owners of Book Passage, and welcome here to, to Book Passage. I, those of you who have been watching this over the last two or three months will know we've gone, the store's gone through major surgery. There was a couple of weeks when we were on life support here. You didn't know where, how you could enter the door or what the place was going to look like, but here we go. We're still we're still working on it, uh, and it's a, it's a work in progress, but I think it's going to be nice when it's done. This is really a pleasure to have this event here tonight. I also uh, help edit and put together the, um, the list of author events in our newsletter that we send out. And because I do that with about a month's advance notice, I can have a chance to get really enthused about what's coming up and get really excited about it. Then every now and then a really good author event comes in after we've gone to press yeah. and I walk in and it kind of blindsides me. And that, that's what happened today. I walked in and I thought, oh my God. This is really something. This is a, this is the kind of book I love. Had really had not that much advance warning on. I've been reading the book this afternoon and absolutely fascinated with it. So I think you're going to really enjoy this. Um, I was just talking to Brian Dorries, the author of the book, and told him, you know, I studied uh, Greek tragedy when I was in college, and I realized I didn't now have to read his book. I don't know anything about it. That the, the idea of a tragic flaw was complete was tragically misstated to him. <laughs> to me in, in my class. You really need to read The Theater of War, just if for no other reason, just to find out all the things you were missing when, when you might have gone through this. So I'm going to introduce the group that I'm going to get out of the way. Um, this is a, uh, The Theater of War it's, is a, it's a series of dra dramatic readings about uh, Sophocles play uh, Ajax, uh, a tragedy about the suicide of a great respected warrior. And it's really intense and, the, and it's so intense because it's so current uh, and uh, these kinds of, of, of issues keep playing themselves themselves out of generation after generation and tragically we see it going on today and I think uh, as Brian will tell you he put together a, a, a group here that's designed just to read uh, these stories to have the cathartic experience of sharing them together and maybe helping somebody who's going through that kind of a process uh, tonight we're just we have some um, uh, a wonderful group here. Uh, Heather Gold Goldenhurst will be one of the readers. She's a movie star with uh, Swallow, The Great Gatsby, The Believer, and just a you know just a wonderful performer. And with her will be David Strathern. And I can't look at David without seeing Edward R. Murrow. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> to me, he was more, <laughs> and good night, good luck. He was more more Murrow than Murrow ever was. was absolutely wonderful performance. I just I have to tell you that. Um, and the one thing they want me to say, and I want to repeat, and I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to walk off the stage and let them talk. Is they really want to have audience participation in this. So when the reading is through, we're encouraging all the questions we can get, and it's a community kind of experience, and it's it's it should be the kind of thing that we will really treasure here at Book Passage. So thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. in Court of Madeira. Uh, tonight marks the 328th performance of Theater of War since wow. the project was started in <laughs> 2008. Over the last uh, six years, we've been all over the country performing for more than 65,000 service members, veterans, their family, concerned citizens like you, uh, in places as diverse as the Pentagon, homeless shelters, special forces, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, Japan, Germany, uh, all over the United States, every service, every branch, every rank, and everywhere we go, we hear the most powerful things spoken by the ancient Greek plays that we perform uh, by audiences who've lived the experiences they describe. And the idea behind Theater of War is very simple. We thought if we could simply put these ancient Greek war plays in front of audiences that had something, some skin in the game, who had some direct relationship to the themes and the values and the struggles and the plays, that something powerful and something healing would happen. And we've learned more from the audiences for whom we've performed uh, than from any book, and certainly um, we espouse the view that audiences always know more than we do. And so we're here to learn from you, just like any other night of the week. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to perform uh, three scenes, or two scenes, from Sophocles' Ajax, an ancient Greek play that was um, written by a general named Sophocles and performed nearly 2,500 years ago in an outdoor amphitheater in the center of Athens for as many as 17,000 citizen soldiers in a century in which the Athenians saw nearly 80 years of war. 
and as soon as we're done with the reading, we're going to invite four members of your community who bravely and kindly agreed to come up and respond from their guts to what they heard and saw in the play that connected with them personally and professionally. We're going to ask them to come up and uh, give us their brief opening responses. Um, they're not. I'm on book tour. They're not on book tour. Um, they're not here with an agenda. They are like you, listening to the play for the first time and responding to it. And after they've responded, I'm going to come out to you and ask you uh, four questions that uh, we've asked 327 other audiences all over the world. And I'll share with things we've heard in other communities. And I know we'll carry with us to our performance tomorrow morning in Dublin for the Army Reserve. Um, things we heard in Corte Madeira and share them there. And that's the idea behind Theater of War. Um, this particular performance is part of a 25 city tour that's been funded by the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation with our national partners, the National Council for Behavioral Health, the Massachusetts General uh, Hospital Academy, and Points of Light. Um, we're honored to be working with these partners on this massive two, two uh, year tour that has been presenting Theater of War, both in military settings, primarily for <coughs> National Guard and Reserve audiences. Um, for our citizen soldiers and also for communities like yours where we're trying to bridge the military civilian divide and have real sort of constructive healing uh, dialogue. So um, I'm going to do something slightly sacrilegious um, before you've already heard of uh, the actors who've come with me, um, David Strathairn, Heather Goldenhurst, I'm here with my producing partner Phyllis Kaufman. Um, these, this company of people is part of a much larger company of close to 200 actors and artists who when they get the call, do you want to fly coach and stay in a Holiday Inn and get up at the crack of dawn and do Greek tragedy for a thousand Marines that have been mandatorily made to watch it? Um, they jump, and David and Emily especially jump, clear their calendar, sometimes give up commercial work to do this because they believe like we do, like Phyllis and I, that there's nothing more important we could be trying to do with our craft and what we're going to try to do with you in the next 90 minutes. Um, you all were not mandatorily made. In the military, it's called being voluntold. You were not, <laughs> a few of you may, but uh, most of you were not voluntold to come. Um, and uh, so your presence and your participation brings great significance and meaning to us and to our, to, to, um, to our craft. Um, so thank you for your presence. Thank you for coming out. Um, so I'll make something very sacrilegious. I'm going to ask you, rather than turning your phones off, to turn them on. Um, part of the grant that we are um, privileged to have that brings us to your community um, has funded um, the development of a, an interactive smartphone app. And if you're allergic to this, um, you know, there's a paper version, there's an analog version that you've got, it's in your uh, program. But um, I know we're in California, we're not far from Silicon Valley. Um, I imagine that many of you are quite technologically adept and for, even though we're in a bookstore, even though we're about to do a theatrical presentation, um, I ask you just for the sake of uh, kindness and generosity, go along with me on this exercise and get out your smartphone um, and download our app. It only takes a few seconds. You can find it on either the Google Play Store or the um, Apple App Store. And the name of the app is Theater of War uh, soldiers and Citizens Tour. Um, you may have an easier time if you search for Theater of War Productions. Especially if you're on an Android. If you just simply search for Theater of War Productions, the app will come up to the top of uh, the list. Um, and when you find it, it will take about 30 seconds to download, 45 seconds at max. Um, it has uh, the name Theater of War written in uh, handwritten lettering. And when you download it, you will see a 2,500-year-old uh, vase painting image of, Sophic, of Ajax burying his sword in the uh, sand. It will come up. I'm going to give people a minute um, to do this. For those of you who, again, are allergic to this, um, we'll just use this for silent. I know meditation is big here. Um, we can just use it for a, a moment of silent meditation. <laughs> Has anyone downloaded it yet? The Theater of War, so, oh, see, there's already one person here. Theater of War Soldiers and Citizens Tour. Or, if you're on Android, Theater of War Productions will bring up the app very quickly. That's right, help your neighbors. That's terrific. <laughs> Has anyone else downloaded it at this point? Oh, look at that. Look at that. Another person. Another person. Um, search on the bottom. Is that an iPhone? Yeah. <laughs> 
She might cancel. Oh, there. Thank you. Theater of War, Soldiers and Citizen Tour, or Theater of War Productions, which we'll bring up. <laughs> Uh, show of hands, who else has been able to, to download at this point? Okay. I'm going to give people another 25, 30 seconds, and then I'll give you just a little bit more instructions. We'll launch in. Okay, it looks like quite a few people have it up, so you can catch up to us if um, you haven't caught up. There'll be plenty of time. Um, but it, at, at the front screen, you'll say check in at live event. If you can click on that, that will bring you to a drop down menu. Select Corta Madeira Community. California. And once you select that, hit submit. So again, if you're to say check in at live events, select Corta Madeira Community, hit submit, and that will bring you to a very, very brief demographic survey. This is anonymous, but it, it helps us understand your reactions to the performance. It helps us shape how we do this in the future. So you just take a minute to fill this out. Um, we'd really appreciate it. Just, just take the uh, just a minute to fill out these brief uh, questions. When you get to the end of that, if you can hit submit and just wait at that point, we'd appreciate it for further instructions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does anyone finish the demographic survey with a hand? Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, we're near six silicon. It's, it's, uh, it's, although I think the people in Seattle were a little faster. <laughs> people in North Dakota actually were the fastest. They've got nothing better to do. <laughs> no, they were the kindest audience we had. All right, so um, let's let, let's presume that many people have gotten to the end of the demographic survey. You've hit submit, and um, that will take you to the final screen before we get started. Um, so hit submit, you should see a screen that says story points at the top. People seeing that screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. That's the story points uh, screen, as it said in the instructions, this is an emotional thermometer. Um, we uh, developed this to get real-time feedback from audiences in terms of what's going on in the mind of the people who are watching the, the performance. Um, zero is I'm feeling nothing. This isn't resonating with me at all. I wish I were home watching. The Blue Jays. Um, 10 is, this is the most transformative experience of my life. You'll be somewhere between 0 and 10 during the reading itself, but we ask you to tap on your phone once we get started. Um, 0 to 10 as you're listening to the reading and, and, uh, progress. Um, one of the things I want to warn you is that it's easy with these amazing Academy Award nominated and Tony Award nominated act actors to forget about my instructions about this app, but if you could remember even when you're swept up in the drama to keep tapping, we'd really appreciate it, because as soon as we're done and we get to the panel, before we get back to you, we're gonna quickly bring up some moments in the play and look at how the audience responded, okay? So without further ado, if you could hit uh, start uh, at the bottom of the screen, this will let our system know that we're getting started. And, and uh, I'm gonna now tell you what you need to know about um, Sophocles Ajax, we'll get right down to business with the reading and then we'll get to the most important part, which is the discussion, which is what we came here for. So the story of Sophocles Ajax begins in the ninth year of the Trojan War. The Greeks have been on the Trojan battlefront for nine consecutive years. No one has gone home. No one has seen his family. It's been one long nine-year deployment. And over those nine long years, the Greeks have lost many of their greatest warriors and leaders. Recently, Achilles died. 
on the Trojan battlefront. As I'm sure you all know, Achilles was the greatest of all Greek warriors. He was so great, the Greeks thought he was invincible, but he had that one place where he could be shot, his Achilles heel, and that's where the enemy took him with the help of a god. In the ninth year of the Trojan War, the greatest of all Greek warriors went down. And this was a major blow to the Greek army. They never thought they'd see this day, never conceived. They'd lose their greatest leader, but they had no time to mourn their loss, no way of processing their grief. All they could do was suck it up and soldier on with the fight. Ajax was not known to be the greatest, but he was known as the strongest of all Greek warriors. He was so strong, the Greeks called him the shield, because he and his unit were always in the most forward of locations, laying their lives in the line for the Greek army, sustaining the greatest losses. Ajax was an upstanding leader who won battles through core values like honor and courage and commitment. He always tried to do the right thing, even in the fog of war. And Ajax was also a great friend of Achilles, as well as his cousin. And so when Achilles died, no one mourned his loss more than Ajax. And if you Google this now or later, you'll find vase paintings from more than 2,500 years ago of the mighty Ajax carrying the body of his fallen friend Achilles over his shoulder off the battlefield. In the ancient world, the greatest honor was to receive the armor of someone honorable, especially if it was your enemy, but even if it, especially if it was your friend, but even if it was your enemy, and to receive the armor of Achilles after he died was the greatest honor one could receive in the Trojan War, and because of everything he had done for his country, because of the men he had lost, because of the nine long years of nonstop fighting, and I cannot stress this enough, because of his unresolved grief over the loss of his best friend, Ajax believed he deserved the armor of Achilles. And everyone else in the Greek army thought that Ajax deserved the armor too. But unfortunately, as these things sometimes go, both in the ancient and now in the modern world, the process by which the armor was given out got political. And the generals decided to hold a contest to see who deserved the armor of Achilles. And one of the competitions in the contest was speech making. And while Ajax was always great with his strength and his courage, he was never great with words. And he tried to make a speech, but he couldn't find the words. And he stumbled all over himself and made an embarrassment of himself in front of the Greek army. And then Ajax watched Odysseus walk onto the scene. Odysseus in our version is like the head of the Greek CIA, an upper level administrator, a man who wears a suit to work, a man who never put his life on the line for anyone. And Odysseus comes onto the scene, he makes this beautiful speech about why he deserves the armor of Achilles, and then Ajax watches the generals award his best friend's armor to Odysseus. Mm -hmm. And this is a major blow. It strips Ajax his sense of self, his manhood, his identity. It, it humiliates him in front of his fellow soldiers. And Ajax goes back to his tent where he lives on the outskirts of the Greek encampment with his wife and his three-year-old son, and he paces the floor of his tent through the night, consumed with an all-consuming rage for the generals who passed him over for the award. And finally, just after midnight, against the pleading of his wife, Tecmessa, Ajax leaves behind his tents under cover of night and goes down to the generals' tents with every intention of taking their lives. And he slips inside the generals' tents as they sleep in their beds, and he stands only feet from the generals, and he raises his weapon high in the air, and just as Ajax is about to strike the sleeping generals, Athena enters the tent, goddess of wisdom and war and military justice. There's been an infraction. An officer has come to kill fellow officers. Athena blinds Ajax, sends him reeling out of the tent into a field full of animals, cows, goats, sheep. Ajax opens his eyes, has no idea how he got there, but trembling with nine long years of pent-up rage, frustration, anger, and grief, Ajax vents all of his rage, all of his grief, all of his emotions on the animals around him, slitting throats, snapping spines, lopping off heads. In a matter of seconds, he annihilates a field of animals with the precision of a great trained warrior. And in so doing, in that act, he enters into a berserk state of mind in which he actually begins to believe the animals he's killing are the very men he came to kill. And he drags several of the animals back to his tent and continues to torture them through the night in front of his wife, in front of his son, taking pleasure in their pain, feeling at long last that he has finally vanquished his so-called enemies. The play begins at dawn. When the generals hear the rumor of what Ajax came to do, they immediately dispatch a unit to ascertain if he is the one who did this thing. And if he is, they have been given orders to take Ajax out. And as the light is breaking, Ajax, his own men, his sailors and soldiers who've been fighting alongside him for nine long years, they too have heard the rumor. They've seen the trail of blood leading into Ajax's tent. And they begin to debate amongst themselves, the chorus, as to whether to stay or to abandon their leader in his moment of need. To stay might mean treason. To stay might mean death. To abandon him might mean to abandon all of their values and everything they've been fighting for all this time. Just as a small fraction of the men breaks off and starts running toward the ships, finally, Ajax's wife comes out of the tent, runs down the dirt path, <coughs> throws herself down in front of Ajax's men, and begs them to help her stop Ajax from harming himself or anyone else when he wakes up 
and sees what he's actually done. Without further ado, our two scenes from Sophocles' Ajax. Oh, you salt of the earth, you sailors who serve Ajax! Those of us who care for the house of Telamon will soon wail. For our fierce hero sits shell-shocked in his tent, glazed over, gazing into oblivion. He has the thousand-yard stare. What terrors visit him in the night to reverse his fortune by morning? Tell us, Tecmessa, battle one bride, for no one is closer to Ajax than you. So you will speak as one who knows. Well, how can I say something that should never be spoken? You would rather die than hear what I'm about to say. A divine madness poisoned his mind, tainting his name during the night. Our home is a slaughterhouse, littered with cow carcasses and goats gushing thick blood, throats slit horn to horn by his hand, evil omens of things to come. That's true what they say about the hot-headed man. The great story grows louder and louder with each Greek who tells it. I'm afraid of what lies on the horizon. He will die when he looks around and sees what he has done. For with his dark sword and his mad hand, he's chopped the herds and herdsmen into pieces. Over there, over there, that, that, that is where he dragged them, bound with ropes. He executed some inside, forcing them to the ground. The rest he tore apart, savagely scratching away at their flanks with his fingers. With one quick chop, he severed the head of a white-footed ram and let it drop to the floor. Then grabbing another by the throat, he tied it down and ripped out its tongue. Then he lashed it with his harsh whip until there was nothing left to lash, all the while spewing vile words that must have come from a god. The time has come for us to hide our faces and run as far as we can, or board the ships in a row wherever the oceans will allow. Hounded by sharp words and hard stones hurled by the generals and their men, we must try to escape his fate. But he has come back to his senses, and as a warm wind always follows the last lightning flash, his rage has been swept away, only to reveal fresh wounds, for there is nothing more troubling for a man than to discover an evil crime of which he is the culprit. If fury has left him, he will start to feel better soon, for the source of his suffering has vanished. Well, then, tell me, given the choice, which would you prefer, happiness while your friends are in pain, or to share in their suffering? Twice the pain is twice as worse. Well, then we'll get sick while he recovers. What do you mean? I don't follow the logic of your words. In his madness, he took pleasure in the evil that possessed him, all the while afflicting those of us nearby. But now that the fever has broken, all of his pleasure has turned to pain, and we are still afflicted just as before. Twice the pain is twice the sorrow. I'm afraid that some god has struck him down, for his anguish grows as his sanity returns. Yeah, it is true, but still hard to understand. How did the madness first take hold of him? Tell us, we'll stay and share in the pain. <coughs> Since your pain is now mine, I will share this with you too. In the dead of night, when the lamps no longer burned, Ajax found his sword and moved toward the door. Naturally, I objected, where are you going? No messenger has come calling for help. All of the soldiers are asleep. Please, come back to bed. He turned to me and firmly said, Woman, silence becomes a woman. And I've heard him say that before, and I know what it means, so I quit asking questions, and he left without saying a word. Whatever happened then, I, I cannot say, but it, soon he returned, pulling bulls and sheep tied up with ropes. Dealing with some, he lopped off their heads, slit throats, and snapped spines. Others he tortured as if they were men. Finally, he dashed outside and spoke to someone in the shadows, cursing the generals in Odysseus and bragging and laughing about sweet revenge. He quickly returned to the tent and slowly returned to his senses. When he finally saw what he had done, taking in the carnage, he struck his head and groaned like a bull, diving onto the bodies, rolling in their blood, clawing at his face and tearing at his hair. For a long time he sat in silence, rocking on the floor, but then he wanted to know what happened and threatened to hurt me if I didn't tell him all that I knew. I, I feared for my life and quickly coughed up the bitter story. He started to make these low sounds, the kind I never thought I'd hear him make, for he always told his, told his men that crying was for women and cowards. Tired from all the tears, he now rests in his mess, strangely silent, refusing food or water, planning to do some terrible thing. I, I can hear it in his voice. That is why I came to you. Go inside and see what you can do. Men will often listen to friends. Terrible of the evils of which you spoke that drove him mad. No, I but, I'm afraid things will get worse. Did you hear that no. low moan groan no. rolling up from Ajax's throat? Either he must be ill or made sick by the thought of his illness. My boy, bring me my boy. Oh, God, no. 
Where is he? He wants to see his boy. You're sick. He's... Tusser. Where is Tusser? Always out raiding. I'm in here dying. He's never near when I need him most. That's the same man's voice. Open the door. Perhaps he'll snap out if it was shame when he sees familiar faces. There. They are open. Now you can see him as he is and look upon the evil he has done. You sailors, you loyal friends, you stood by me through the worst of times. Do you see this wave of destruction full of chum and guts crashing on all sides? Sadly, we're right. He has come unhinged. You skilled sailors who joined me on the open seas to row against our enemies, you are the only men who can help me now. Cut my throat right here, right now. Add me to this pile. End my suffering. Do not say these things. You will not cure evil with evil, for if we try, the pain will only grow worse than the illness that brought it upon you. Do you see what I have done? I was the bravest in battle, never lost my wits, and now I've killed these harmless barnyard animals with my hands. What a joke my life has become, my reputation, my sense of honor. Lord Ajax, I beg you not to talk this way. Will you not leave me alone? Will you not go? On my knees, please relent. Use your head. I was the one who let his enemies slip away and turned upon bulls and white goats to shed black blood in the night. It's done is done, sir. There's no changing the past. You slick trickster, you cowardly fox, double-crossing, arrogant Odysseus. I can hear your loud laughter rattling in my skull, mocking me for this mistake. The gods say when men laugh and cry. If only I could look him in the eye, even though I am destroyed. Swallow your proud words, sir. Don't you see the quicksand in which we now stand? Zeus! Father of my forefathers, let me kill that man of many turns, the one I hate, along with the brother kings. Then let me die. Pray for my death, too. I will not live when you are dead. Darkness, my light, black abyss. Take me down to live in oblivion, for I am no longer worthy to live among gods or men. Athena, gray-eyed goddess, daughter of Zeus, will torture me until I'm dead. Nowhere to run, no escape. My greatness dies on this heap of beasts. I defeated myself with delusions. The entire army will march on my body. It's hard to hear a strong man say such weak words. You surging straits, roaring with waves, you caves, you groves along the coast. You have held me at Troy for many long years. No longer, no longer when I have ceased to fill my lungs with air. I speak to those who understand. You river streams of Scamander, killer of Greeks, you shall never see my face again in your waters. I will say it plainly, the face of the best warrior ever to be seen in Greece, in Troy, who came from Greece and now lies here, wallowing in filth, stripped of all honor. It's not for me to say if you should hold back or go on this way, having seen the evil things you've seen. Uh, I, 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 uh, my name is a sad song. Who would have thought it would someday become the sound a man makes in despair? I, uh, after Troy, my father Telamon rode home in a victory parade. He made quite a name for himself here in this country, receiving full honors from the army. But now I, the son, stand in the place where my father once stood with no less troops, and no fewer triumphs, but my body will rot on strange soil, dishonored in front of fellow soldiers. <clears throat> this much I know. If Achilles still lived and decided to hold a contest for his arms, awarding them to the greatest warrior at the end of the day, they would be mine! But the generals gave the arms to a man without morals, ignoring all the times I risked my life to defend them against our enemies. And if my eyes and mind had not been twisted by a sickness, taking me off target, the generals and Odysseus would not have lived to cast their votes, let alone see the morning. But the relentless dark-eyed daughter of Zeus ravaged me with madness as I stood beside their beds, and so I stained my hands with the blood of cows. The men I hunted down narrowly escaped. Through no fault of mine, they laugh at me, for with the gods' help, the weak evaded the strong. What should I do now? The gods hate me, the Greeks loathe me, the Trojans despise me. Perhaps I should set sail for home, across the open sea, leaving behind ships and men and the sons of Atreus. 
what will I say to my father Telamon when he sees my face? How will he even bear to look at me when I explain how I disgraced our family name for which he fought so hard? His heart will break right then and there. Should I scale the walls of Troy and face the army by myself, show them what I'm made of, and then die? No, oh no. That would only please the general. I must do something bold to erase all doubt in my father's mind that his son was anything but a coward. When a man suffers without end in sight and takes no pleasure in living his life day by day wishing for death, he should not live out all his years. It is pitiful when men hold on to false hopes. A great man must live in honor or die an honorable death. That is all I have to say. No one will ever say that what you just said was spoken by anyone other than you, Ajax. Your words were true to your heart and your spirit. But just for a moment, release your thoughts and listen to what those who love you have to say. Lord Ajax, there is nothing worse in this world for men than the necessity of fate. I came from a wealthy family. My father was the richest man in Phrygia. Now I am a slave. The gods willed that you would win me with your strength, and I have accepted my destiny of sharing your bed and have come with time to love you very much. And so I beg you by our home and by the bed we share, do not let me suffer at the hands of your enemies. Do not turn me over to the men whom you hate. For on the day you die, moments after your death, your son and I will be snatched up violently by the Greeks and treated like slaves. One of my new masters will sneer at me and say, look, there's that woman, the mistress of Ajax, the strongest warrior in the entire army. Can you actually believe that people used to envy her? She's nothing now but a common slave. That's what he'll say, and worse, and the pain of it will be my fate, and the shame of it will stain your family. Mm. Think about your father, whom you will be ab abandoning in the throes of old age, and your, your poor old mother who spends all her days praying that you will someday return home alive. And what about your son? Can you imagine how hard your death will be on him, growing up fatherless and without food on the table, living with men who hate him for being your son? I have nowhere else to go, no one whom to turn. My parents are dead. You've destroyed my homeland. You now are my homeland, my safety, my life. Nothing else matters but you. I ask you to remember all the good times we had and treat me kindly. For a noble man always remembers those who gave him pleasure and protects them from danger. I hope you will pity this woman and welcome her words as we do. I will welcome her when she has done as she's been told. My dear Ajax, I shall always do as you say. Then bring me my boy! So that I can see him. Forgive me, sir, I hid him in fear. Or oh, were you afraid he would see his father covered in blood? I would afraid he would lose his life if you laid eyes on him. Oh, I suppose that was right, given the state I was in. I tried my best to keep him out of harm's way. I approve of your actions. You showed great foresight. My sweet Ajax, what can I do to make things better between us? Let me see my boy. Let me speak with him man to man. He is guarded nearby. Why am I made to wait uh, for him? Your Sakees, your father calls you. It, it's all right. There's nothing to fear. Yes, lift him up to me. That's right. Lift him up right here. He won't be afraid of freshly spilled blood, not my boy. A father must expose his son to things like this, toughen him up, mold his nature. My dear boy, may you have better luck than your father, but come to resemble him in all other ways, especially bravery. I envy you, son. Your hands slip around in the blood, and yet they are clean. Ignorance is bliss before you know pleasure and pain. But when you grow up, your enemies will see your father in your actions. Until then, I want you to enjoy being a boy, play in the warm breeze, and make your mother smile. None of the Greeks will insult you or mistreat you, though you will be fatherless. I will leave you to the care of my half-brother Teucer to raise you to be a man. He isn't afraid to hunt his enemies, even if he's never around when I need him the most. 
you loyal sailors who fought alongside me with your thick shields to hold back our enemies on the battle lines, you will now report to Tusa. Stand by him as he brings my boy to see my father Telamon and my mother Eroboea, so he may look after them as they slowly decline into the darkness below. And hear this clearly. No man shall ever touch my arms or win them in a contest after I am gone. They will not be taken by the Greeks or by the thief who stole my honor. They now belong to my boy, after which he was named. That's right, son. Eurysaches means a strong shield. That's what you are destined to be. So take what is rightfully yours and carry it with you always. It is your namesake, my unbreakable shield sewn from the hides of seven bulls. The rest of the arms will be buried with my body. <clears throat> Take him away from me and lock the doors now. And hold back your tears. This is no time for crying. Go inside, shut the gates before I lose my mind. It scares me to hear you speak with such an edge in your voice. I know that tone, Ajax. What evil thing are you planning to do? No more questions. Silence is best. Show some restraint. By our son and by the gods, I now grovel at your feet. Please, please do not abandon us. Do not talk about the gods. I owe them nothing now. Do not curse yourself. I'll save it for those who will listen. Will you not listen? You have already said too much. Out of fear, my lord. Shut the gates, woman. For God's sake, back down. It is far too late to shape my nature. Don't be stupid. Leave me alone. I've grown so homesick over these months, encamped on the outskirts of Troy, worn down by the tortures of time, waiting here to die and someday set foot on the black dust of Hades' shores. And now I must care for incurable Ajax, his mind infected by divine madness, caught up in thoughts. He unnerves his friends as we watch his greatest acts of bravery slip through his fingers, only to be forgotten, erased from history by the generals. The suffering patient who lives on with endless affliction is better when he rests in Hades. Great mysterious time reveals and conceals all things. Darkness into light, light into darkness. Nothing is beyond its reach. Curses sworn in wild rage are reversed. Iron wills bend. Even I, who just moments ago stood unmovable, am now moved by the words of this woman. I do not wish to leave her a widow or abandon my boy at the feet of enemies. I shall scrub off this grime in the salt marshes by the sea, cleanse away the goddess's rage. Then I will find virgin earth in which to bury this sword, worst of all weapons, where no one will look upon it again engulfed in shadows, protected in Hades. It was a gift from my deadliest enemy, Hector. The saying is true, the gifts of enemies are never gifts. In time, I will yield to the gods and learn to obey the generals. They are my superiors, and as a soldier, I must follow their orders. Go inside, woman. Pray to the gods that I will achieve what I have in my heart to do. Pray with her, friends, and when Teucer comes, relay these orders. Look after me and be loyal to you in all ways. I will now go where I must go. Do as I've asked, and you will see that as unlucky as I have been today, I am now saved. And if scene one, so for scene two, here's all you need to know. Ajax slips away from his tent and he goes down to the salt marshes by the sea with the sword of Hector, his enemy's sword. But instead of burying his sword deep in the earth as he said he would do, he buries it blade up in the sand. And now Ajax is alone on a sand dune, no one for miles, staring at the blade, gleaming in the sunlight, contemplating what he's going to do. The killer now stands where it will cut the best. In enemy soil. A gift from Hector, my mortal enemy, recently sharpened on an iron grinding stone, now packed firmly in the earth, so it will deliver a quick and easy death. All set. I call upon Zeus, 
father of my father, only to ask one thing, that the news of my death is delivered to Teucer so he may be the first to see me covered in blood, having fallen upon this sharp sword, and so that I may not be discovered by my enemies who will only feed my body to vultures and dogs. This is all I ask. I call out to Hermes, escort of the dead who delivers men to the underworld to guide this sword as it pierces my rib cage, so it skewers my heart and ends my life instantly, sparing me pain after the plunge. I call upon the fury those long striding dread maidens who avenge humans and see to their endless suffering witness how the generals have destroyed me train your eyes on those evil men snatch them with your talons and just as i die at my own hands may they also be murdered by their own flesh and blood it is feeding time gorge yourselves on the generals and their men Fiercely descend upon the army, devour it whole, spare no soldier. I call out to you, Helios, as your burning chariot streaks across the sky. When you come to my home, pull back your blazing reins and pause to announce my death to my poor old father and to the pitiful woman who nursed me as a child. No doubt when she hears the news, her wailing will be heard through the hills. No more talk of tears. It's time. Death, oh death, come now and visit me. But I shall miss the light of day and the sacred fields of Salamis where I played as a boy and great Athens and all of my friends. I call out to you, springs and rivers, fields and plains, who nourished me during these long years at Troy. These are the last words you will hear Ajax speak. The rest I shall say to those who listen in the world below. <laughs> what was that sound coming from the trees? Wretched! I am wretched! I see the battle one bride overcome with grief. It's over, friends. Everything is lost. What is it? Ajax, freshly dead, impaled on his sword. There will be no more hope of homecoming. He's killed us with his death. We'll be dead upon arrival, coming back in body bags. Poor woman. He has died, and we must weep. But whose hand did he go down? By his own. Look at how the sword juts out of the earth. How could I have been so blind? So deaf to his cries, as the red blood gushed from a hole in his chest. Where is he? Where is unbending Ajax, whose name is now a sad, sad song? He is not to be seen. I will cover his body with his white cloth, for no one who loved him could bear to see the black blood dripping from his nostrils and the deep self-inflicted wound, the gaping hole at the center of his chest. What am I to do now? Which of you will lift him? Where is it to, sir? He should be here by now to help prepare the body for a proper burial. We, we don't have much time. Oh, Ajax, this was no way to die. Not for you. Even your enemies will weep when they see The man of many turns now mocks our suffering. He's laughing at us along with the generals. Oh, let them laugh. Let them all laugh. They won't laugh for long when they lack his shield in combat. Evil men only appreciate good men like Ajax after they're gone. His death is as bitter to me as it, as, as, as it is sweet to them and pleasant for him, for he died according to his wishes. They have no reason to claim victory over him, for it was a god who took his life, not them. Let Odysseus curse his name and hurl hard words. Ajax won't hear them. He is gone, far away from here. He knows neither their laughter nor my loud moans. And of scene two, that's the end of our dramatic presentation for this evening. Thank you very much for your attention.
Um, so for those of you who were remembering to tap along, if you could press end on story points, uh, we really appreciate it. That way our, our system will know that we've finished our reading. Um, this is not where the play ends. This is um, this, the suicide is the halfway mark in the play. Um, the reason we end here is because we want to get to our discussion, but here's um, briefly what happens um, after Ajax takes his own life. His wife arrives, then his brother arrives milliseconds too late to save him. His brother, Tusser, for whom he's been calling out all this time. And he says to the men, where can I show my face among what men when I was not where you needed me, when you needed me the most regarding uh, Ajax? And he, some of our military audiences have talked about how that sounds like survivor's guilt to them. Although I'm not sure the word survivor's guilt fully carries the weight of what it must be like for a brother to lose his brother this way. And then fast forward to the end of the play, the four-star general Agamemnon, the commander of the Greek army, he arrives and he says of Ajax's body, which has been left on stage for the entire second half of the play, leave that man's body to rot above the earth. He shall receive no burial. He shall be fed to the dogs. Mm. In the final seconds of the play, Odysseus, the very man who won the honor of Achilles' armor with his wit and his rhetoric, he comes back and he defends Ajax's body to the general. And he says, of Ajax, he says, I'm moved by admiration for his greatness rather than hatred for his smallness. Many of our friends later become our enemies. I don't see friends and enemies as mutually exclusive. And he tries to convince the general to allow Ajax to be buried. And the general won't really hear anything that he's saying. He washes his hands of the situation. He walks away, and the play ends with a funeral procession. Not the high honors that Ajax would have received had his life not taken this violent and precipitous turn, but a burial nonetheless that honored his humanity, his family, uh, his sacrifice. I mention this ending 2,500 years later because we are still struggling with this set of issues that are raised by the play. How do we honor the sacrifice of men and women like Ajax who sacrifice both their physical and sometimes even their mental and their spiritual health, doing the work that they do uh, without honoring the violence that took place at the end of his life and sometimes the end of theirs? How do we balance those needs, those concerns? Um, we'll return to that in our conversation um, before we do, I'm going to turn things over to our panel. So I'd like to ask our panelists to come up and take um, their place up here. I'm just going to move this stuff. You might want to go around um, this way. Uh, it's kind of a minefield. Um, don't trip on that. Yeah, please. Um, while our panelists are coming up, um, I just want to plant the first seed. The first question I'm going to ask you as an audience as soon as they're done with their very brief um, opening remarks. Um, please. I'd love for you to think about this because um, although I know it's a Friday night, I imagine people have places to go and we're going to keep things as surgically on time as we can. Um, so I'd love for you to think about this while they're talking and then when they're done, um, I'll turn it out to you and ask you the question again. Now that you've seen these two and a half actors going for broke, trying to make sense of this ancient Greek tragedy with minimal rehearsal, a long plane ride from New York, um, minimal sleep, and you know this play was written by a general and performed for as many as 17,000 citizen soldiers in the century in which the Athenians saw nearly 80 years of war. Here's the question I'd love for you to think about. What do you think this guy Sophocles was up to when he staged this play for his community? What was he trying to say? What was his objective? What was he up to? So we'll return to that question in a few seconds before we do. I'm going to turn things over to our panel. Leslie, I believe you are going to go first. I'm going to let you, um, I'm going to let these panelists introduce themselves so you can hear who they are as it pertains to what they have to say, and I'll turn things over to you first, uh, Leslie. Thank you so much, Brian, and what a beautiful reading. My name's Leslie Courier. I am the co-founder, along with my husband, Bob, of Marin Shakespeare Company. We perform plays in a beautiful outdoor amphitheater uh, on Dominican University campus. We do many, many education programs for students of all ages, particularly young people. And for the last 12 years, I have taught Shakespeare at San Quentin Prison and now Solano State Prison, where the men both perform Shakespeare plays and tell their own stories inspired by the themes from Shakespeare. Last year, uh, some, one of the men at San Quentin who had started a group called Veterans Healing Veterans saw that autobiographical storytelling and asked me if I would come and work with a group of veterans at San Quentin Prison to help them create their own play and tell their own stories. Um, we created an hour-long play based on uh, the autobiographical stories of the men in that room that was coincidentally called Theater of War, <laughs> and which you can see online. Uh, one of my former students is Gary Hulls, who's sitting right next to me. I'll let him introduce himself uh, when I'm uh, next. He's going to speak next. Um, 
I I was I, I was so interested to hear in the story of Ajax that as brave and as powerful and as accomplished a warrior as Ajax was, his downfall came because of his inability to speak and tell his story in an appropriate way. Uh, Sophocles, of course, uh, corrects that error by writing this beautiful play that uh, gives actors a chance to tell Ajax's stories. Um, my work with, with veterans has been to help veterans tell their stories and part of what, what one of the many things I've learned um, from the men who I worked with was they need to talk to each other. They need to talk to people who understand what they've been through, who share those experiences and who can respond appropriately and they need to learn how to talk to people who haven't been there and to be able to tell those stories in order to heal. So, Gary, oh, you're thank up. <laughs> My name is Gary Valentino Hollis. I thank you all for coming out this evening and give yourself a warm, warm applause. <laughs> <laughs> I think you gentlemen did a very good job of the uh, stage theater. Um, I was just released from prison after doing it over 20 years. Um, I served in the United States Navy, first class petty officer, E6 hospital corpsman. Um, there wasn't a lot of help when I was in the military to overcome some of the tragic uh, PTSD and, and some other things that we men who serve for our country go through. Um, mentally, it's been a very hard road and still today, I struggle with some of the things to overcome. Um, a person asked me, how do you determine greatness? And a lot of people determine greatness as wealth, success. And, and he asked me this question, and this, this gentleman was 101 years old, and he was a veteran. And I told him, um, greatness is defined to me, the things that you learn to overcome. And I'm working on overcoming those things. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Courier um, has been a very tremendous help, um, helping us men in prison to re-entry into society and to be productive citizens. Um, by her coming in with her time and her effort, I mean, this lady is beautiful. She's, she was like the sun that comes in to a dark place. And we were the roses, just trying to blossom through this concrete. And our failure was our broken petals. And uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, I'm allowed to touch you now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's been so much of an inspiration. Um, she has helped me to overcome a lot of things um, just by participating in the theater of, of art war. Um, I learned so much from this lady. And she's a little sister to me. She's older than I am, but still she's a little sister. <laughs> um, Ajax. There's a lot of Ajax out there. Um, we all need to find a way to overcome some of our tragedy moments in our lives. Whether it's war, divorces, death, loss of loved ones. We need to be more um, participating in talking to someone to release that stuff. Because this is what it is, it's stuff. And uh, we need to learn how to approach people and to be able to communicate to get those things out of our lives so we won't end up like Ajax. Um, I thank you all for having me here. I can go on and on. I love people. I just don't like to feel <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. First of all, this is this is incredibly humbling, both the performance as well as uh, Leslie and Gary hear their stories. Uh, I have the opportunity as a community education associate to do a lot of speaking in front of people. I've been in this position at Sword Supply Shares for four months now. Prior to that, I worked in a permanent supportive housing unit in San Francisco. I'm Tim Jacob, by the way. I give a lot of talks to crowds around your size of police officers and mental health care specialists. 
Once I was tasked with that responsibility, I had the tough decision of, if I want to be authentic and relate to people, I have to tell my story. And that was really tough to do. And what I didn't realize is how cathartic and helpful it would be for me as a person. So instead of going into the 20 minute memorized cold open that I do every time, that I thought was really gripping, but in comparison to today's uh, presentation was not that gripping, um, I'll break it down for you really quick. I was in the Marine Corps for five years, from 2000 to 2005, the last eight months of which were in Iraq. At the age of 21 or 22, I was responsible for six or seven Marines and four CH-53 Echo helicopters about the size of a school bus. So I'm responsible for these Marines and their, wel their welfare, the helicopters themselves, as well as the lives of the people who flew on them and the lives of the people who we were supporting. I took it very seriously. I came from a really bad background and I wasn't exactly the happiest Marine. I was very outspoken, originally from Brooklyn. And so I depended upon, <laughs> I depended upon my, my intellect, uh, my people skills, and honestly sheer rage to drive myself forward and to do the best job I could. I really, really cared. Well, unfortunately, two months into Iraq, in the summer of 2004, August 11th, my older, my older brother's birthday, actually, a uh, current Marine, a major, one of our planes crashed. And in Iraq, we had to make a lot of exceptions in terms of maintenance on those aircraft. I was 100% responsible for the safety of all the avionic systems, missile defense systems, and flight controls on those aircraft. And I knew of, at the time, a couple of issues on the plane that I wouldn't have let slide back in the States. And it was uncertain as to why the plane crashed. Two Marines died, several were severely injured and their careers were ruined, and I, I carried that guilt with me. But at the time, honestly, I felt nothing. At best, I could feel anger. And looking back, it's probably because in such a situation with so much responsibility, I couldn't afford to feel anything else. Five or six months later, I flew out of Iraq and became a civilian. Six months after that, I was sitting on a couch at my dad's in Brooklyn, same place right now in Bensonhurst. And we were talking about my experience in Iraq. Nothing really heavy, no big conversation. I didn't really tell him the, the gritty details. And I got really mad at him. I said to him, what do you know about you know, the war? What do you know about the military? You weren't a Marine like my, my older brother who was also there in Brooklyn at the apartment at the time, or my younger brother, another Marine. And I storm off into the second bedroom he has, this tiny little purple bedroom, still purple to this day. <laughs> and I start bawling in control, but just crying my eyes out. And my older brother, who had been to Iraq twice by that point, comes in. And I told him, I said, uh, you know, I was responsible 100% for the, the deaths of two Marines. One who I unfortunately didn't get along with well and got in an argument with right before the crash. So we talked about it for a little bit. I cleaned myself up, went back into the living room and didn't think about it for the next 10 years until I started giving these talks. And I realized how much I'm still affected by it and decided to finally start talking to a therapist at a vet center, is what they call it, down in San Jose. And I'm finally coming to terms with it, with the, the guilt I felt, not only about the possibility of having caused that crash, which I didn't, um, now I know, I finally decided to read about it online, <laughs> and the fact that I didn't really seem to feel bad at the time that it occurred, that's what I felt worst about. I felt kind of like a monster for feeling nothing but anger and doing what I had to do, which was continue, um, continue with the mission. So this whole Ajax performance to me really, in some ways, symbolizes this unconscious dialogue that I've had with myself in one way or another for the last 10 or 11 years. Have I ever considered suicide? I, I wouldn't say so. Have I sabotaged myself and has my self-confidence been affected in such a way that I'm not exactly, I, you, you could say, where I'd want to be in life? At this point, although I'm extremely grateful to be where I am right now, and uh, it's, I feel incredibly lucky to be here, yes, I think it has affected myself and my relationships with loved ones, with coworkers and college students, dramatically. And that's what I talk about when I talk about with police officers, talk about it with police officers, and, and now the, the general public as well. In other words, PTSD is very real, and I have deep, deep respect for people who are dealing with it. I may or may not be dealing with it, 
But what I am dealing with and have dealt with is tremendous guilt, which unto itself can be severely debilitating. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to communicate that to you all. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Dr. Sushma Taylor. I'm a clinical psychologist. I run Centerpoint, I'm the chief executive. And I want to start off, before I tell you a little bit about what our agency does, is to um, compliment the, the actors, uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to thank all of the men and women who have served um, and, and who have given, uh, have sacrificed for our country. But I also want to applaud the families who also support them and in some ways go to war with them. Um, Centerpoint is a nonprofit here, um, headquartered in Marin County, although we have programs in uh, Oklahoma and Texas, uh, Sacramento, Oakland. Uh, we uh, provide um, behavioral health services, substance abuse treatment, um, mental health services. We work in uh, four California prisons, providing some similar services behind the walls and do the bridge into the community. Um, we provide both residential outpatient services and of course a range of psychosocial services. Our programs in Austin, Texas are devoted entirely to veterans. We've been particularly um, interested in working with um, um, women veterans who are um, who have, in addition to uh, trauma from the war theater, the sexual assault that accompanies uh, a lot of the, the the conflicts for some of the women that we're dealing with. Um, the stories that that, that you, you you hear from the panelists and the stories of Ajax are are true. They're they're alive. And one of the things that, that when, and we see this conflict because. We're at the end of providing the services that they need, and we're we're um, we're grateful for the opportunity to do so. We're privileged to do so. I also want to acknowledge several of my my colleagues, people who work with me, and two of two Marines who have also honorably served: Steve Jackson from Brooklyn, Thane Taylor, my own son. in addition to working with um, veterans and National Guardsmen. I think one of the, the, the things that came up for me uh, in, in, in watching the play and he was listening to it was the, the, the tremendous conflicts that Ajax had, particularly about the fact that he was not really fully understood, or perhaps he was misunderstood, and that he could not explain to people uh, the, the, his, his own value system and how his code oh, uh, 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 was so important to him and he didn't understand why others couldn't understand why he was taking the position he was taking. And this, this inability to, to express those inner conflicts and challenges are there for a lot of our folks who are returning because they, they don't have the voice always to express the, the, the deep feelings. They also um, have, have been trained to hold, on, hold those feelings back, particularly if you are in, in, on the front lines, you, you have to act very, very quickly, responsibly, and to <coughs> put all aside feelings and thoughts and everything else, and you just move into action. And now they're coming back into civilian life. And a lot of times, the, I think the biggest struggle is we don't always understand them. And so uh, my message is we have to encourage them to speak. And sometimes we just have to listen to their body language, even when their voices are not so loud. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank all four of you. It's no small thing to get up in front of your community and make such personal connections and insights in front of an audience, maybe people you don't know. Um, this is what Theater of War is about, and so you've made it possible tonight. I just want to thank you for your courage and for, for starting us off. Um, I'm now going to just, uh, for a brief moment, and I'm going to, I think we'll, we'll project over your head, Gary, but um, um, uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not in it. So, um, and I'm going to bring my shadow into it as well, because this is a small space. Um, briefly, um, you guys did a really great job of, of, of tapping along. You can see the 0 to 10 in the, in the colors as they get intensified up to the top. 
This is a one uh, of the early moments in the play we're looking at when Ajax comes out of the tent covered in blood and he says to the uh, sailors, uh, you sailors, you loyal friends, uh, cut my throat right here, right now. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of activity, um, especially on the upper register of people responding um, to that moment. This is another moment that we pull out um, where Ajax's wife, Tecmessa, begs him not to hurt himself and she says, you're my homeland, my safety, my life. Nothing else matters but you. And um, tries to convince him to see the big picture and see her, uh, his family and what's at stake. Um, here's another moment uh, where he tells uh, her to, to take away, uh, take her son away from her, uh, from him, and lock the doors. And um, he seems resolute in what he's about to do. Um, here's a moment in which he says, "Shut the gates, woman," and tells her to, um, "It's far too late to shape my nature. Don't be stupid. Leave me alone." Mm. Where he's reached this sort of impasse. And here's an interesting. This is a moment where, after that moment, he comes back and he says, "You know, actually, I'm all right." Um, they're the generals, I must obey their orders, and he says to her, go inside, and he says to the men, do as I've asked, and you'll see that as unlucky as I've been today, I'm now saved. And, um, some people read this as a moment where he's deceiving them with a certain moment of serenity, but he has a real plan of action in his head. And finally, um, the inhuman cry, uh, which uh, Heather emitted, uh, when uh, Tecmessa discovers Ajax's body. So here are just some of the moments from the play that we've pulled out that in, in terms of um, your, your reactions to it and, and you can see the intensity of that final moment right there. And, and we're gonna ask you when the um, event is over, for those of you who were kind enough to use your phones, I know it's a little bit hard to um, fully engage with a, a theatrical pre presentation while using your phones, we really appreciate it. We want you to give us one last set of feedback at the end of the evening through your phone. And for those of you who didn't use your phone, we're going to ask you to fill out paper comment cards and leave them in a basket in the back so we can get as much feedback out of this session as possible. On that app that you've been using as well, our local and national resources that are tailored for this community, whether you're a soldier, or citizen, a veteran, uh, someone who wants to get involved, you can find those on the app as well as an opportunity to share your story anonymously through a section called story points. We'd appreciate if you'd look at those things at some point, whether tonight, here, or when you go home uh, this evening. If you mind bringing the uh, lights back up, um, uh, I'd appreciate it so we're not completely in the dark. Um, so um, now, yeah, that's perfect. I know it's a little bright, it's bracing, um, but uh, tragedy is about waking us up. That's the, that's the, that's the thesis of this work. Um, so now that you've heard these wonderful actors going for broke and you've heard this, these remarkable members of your community sharing such personal and insightful uh, thoughts about what they heard and saw in the play, I'm going to turn out to you and ask you a question. I've asked uh, 327 other audiences all across the country and the world. Uh, what do you think Sophocles was doing when he wrote this play, Ajax, and staged it for his community, 17,000 citizen soldiers in a century that saw 80 years of war? What was his objective? What was he up to? Now, in every audience, no matter how big or small, whether we're in a field house, a <coughs> hospital, a homeless shelter, the Pentagon, a bookstore. <laughs> to show that war, war was bad and shouldn't be. So uh, I was going to say there's always one extremely intelligent, extremely attractive person <laughs> who puts us all out of the long and awkward misery of an interminable silence. And um, this um, lady in the front row has taken on my question by saying to show the world is bad, to show that it shouldn't be. Um, you don't have to be as intelligent or as attractive as the person who just spoke, but we'd love it if someone else would also take this question on. What do you think Sophocles was up to when he wrote this play? What was his objective? What was he up to? Yes, sir. Well, I, I don't have any connection to the military, but uh, one thing that's bothered me in the last several years is noticing the, that in general people don't really have a huge connection to what's going on in war. Uh, you notice in the last several years, Afghanistan is almost never a headline story, mm -hmm. even though we're still there and it's still, you know, real war. We're still losing people. People are getting injured out there. It's just amazing how apathetic it is and one of my struggles has always been how do I as a civilian and a weak one at that get kind of connect how can I even connect to that I don't even know and I think what he was trying to do being somebody who is a general and knows what's going on out there I think he was trying to do that kind of connection do whatever he could 
to make a connection with the soldiers who are out there going through this stuff. Thank you. I mean, one of the huge differences, obviously, between 5th century Athens and 21st century uh, United States of America, Marin County, is that 100% of the Athenians who saw this play, except for maybe some of the foreigners who were in the audience, served. It was, to be a citizen meant to be a soldier, but less than one half a percent of our population has served in the last 14 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is definitely, this, this play that we saw is how this highly militarized democracy debated and engaged with the question of the human cost of war as a community. So I love your question, well how do we in a society that's so disconnected, just by nature of population, let alone interest, how do we have that discourse? Or we're actually thinking about it in the terms that they were back then, really examining the cost itself. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, anyone, yeah, sure, they've got a mic back there, it'll come right to you. Yes, sir. Um, knowing what I know a little bit about the military, uh, I imagine that Ajax's story was not uncommon. No, um, no I, I have a, some experience with guys having to go through war and uh, either not being properly recognized for their sacrifice or just struggling with the aftermath. Yeah. And I think that's what may be possible. So if Sophocles was a general, he experienced that see it time and time again with his men having to lay down their lives and sacrifice and end up with wreckage at the end of it. Yeah. And I think he was trying to connect that maybe to the civilian population of Greece. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, in some ways, one of the core themes of the play is betrayal. Um, it's not particularly kind of leadership either. Um, in the ancient world, the Stratagoi, the, the generals were elected officials. I mean, you, you had to be elected general. So um, this is, you know, there's definitely this, this larger question that's playing through the play, as you aptly point out. What happens when people who've sacrificed so much feel devalued or betrayed? And how, how do we stop the chain reaction that can occur sometimes when people feel they've been betrayed? And in some ways, maybe betrayal is the wound that cuts the deepest. Um, because, uh, as, as Jonathan Shea's been saying, and many other people in the field, I mean, I'll talk about moral injury, some, something that goes against the grain of your moral compass that upsets your sense of right and wrong, that throws your whole world into chaos, usually when you have little control of the situation. Maybe that's one of the things that Sophocles was trying to get at in his play. Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I honor our veterans now and thank them for their service. But then I think about back to the Vietnam War sure. when our soldiers returned and we ignored them. Yeah. And they went into hiding and only now are beginning to yeah. talk with their counterparts about what they went through. Yeah. And the dichotomy of thanking now and not thanking them mm -hmm. um, really puts a strain on belief and disbelief and hope yeah. or non-hope of war because the same thing was done with survivors of the Holocaust, yeah. with what's going on in all of the countries around the world that are um, having refugee problems or having problems, and we're just repeating what Sophocles wrote about yeah. Yeah. 2,700 years ago. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the Vietnam War. I know many people in this audience were alive and around when the, the conflict was occurring. I know this part of the country was you know, decisively um, liberal and, and we've had some really powerful discussions and performances in the Bay Area where we've had people in uniform, people who are conscientious objectors. There seems to be nothing that anyone could say that would ever surprise a veteran in terms of how people ideologically feel. Um, so we'd like to keep the conversation as, as wide, as open as possible. But this larger question of that we're waking up as a country finally, uh, you know, this many decades after the Vietnam conflict and we're, we're doing a better job with our veterans than we did then but what about those people that, that, that were betrayed or were devalued or left behind or, or in some ways hurt by civilians at that point? Your hand was... Blank. Yeah, oh, there's a hand over here. You have the mic, so you, yeah, I'll come back to you. And there's civilians. Okay, great, great, great. I don't want to... I, I, I'm not a veteran. Yeah. I'm the son of a veteran. Yeah. And I was completely unprepared for how much I was going to connect with Tech Mesa and realize there, there are, I think Ajax's situation is not uncommon and we ignore it. I think her situation is not uncommon in all sorts of ways and we ignore it too. The, the costs are enormous for a lot of people and I, don't, I, I think he was trying to say out loud that which was n not allowed to be said. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Sophocles was trying. Thank you. I mean, she has this beautiful line, how can I say something that should never be spoken? 
most of you would rather die than hear what I'm about to say. And in some ways, it seems like the exercise of the play is doing just that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that Sophocles was attempting to, um, in an outlandish, brave act, attempting to heal um, probably himself mm -hmm. and possibly uh, the Athenians. Mm -hmm. Thank you for raising that. You know, we were at a performance uh, in Kentucky, and a veteran stood up after a lot of civilians had spoken for a while and said, you know, when Achilles died, Ajax lost the one person in whom he could confide his pain. Because as a leader, he wasn't going to be able to show it to his men. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, and people have brought this up, if Sophocles, as someone who was at the top of the food chain, also wrote this for, as you say, very personal reasons. There was a hand over here. After you, ma'am, I'm going to ask a second question. I've got th two or three more questions. I'll get us through on time. You can always uh, answer my questions in whatever order you feel compelled to. You can make up your own question and answer it. But I want to move us out of one orbit and into another, just kind of move us through a, a series of themes. Yes. I have a personal perspective, although I don't think it's unique. Uh, I'm the mother of an active duty Marine. And I'm also a Blue Star Mom, which is a national organization of um, active duty military. And I think the display is a cry and a message to all of the Athenians, but be prepared. They're going to come home. And it's not just Ajax who suffers in this way. And his wife is crying out and saying, I'm not, I'm not the only one affected. It will be your child. It will be your parents. It will be your stepbrother. And that even though we have our military who are at war, and they're busy, and they're doing their jobs, there's the family that's at home that's not busy that's holding the heart, that's holding the heart, that's holding the place. Mm -hmm. And he's calling out and saying, they're coming. They're going to come back home. And they'll all suffer in some way. Mm -hmm. And we'll all carry, whether we can heal them or just carry their burden, and there's nothing we can do. Because they'll have to heal themselves. We can only hold the heart and hold the place. Mm -hmm. So that, from my perspective, that's what I was hearing. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a perfect segue to my second question. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to mention <coughs> along those lines that um, the, com the most common answer we hear to that first question, and we've heard it so many times in so many places, but the first time was in a US base in Germany. A young uh, enlisted soldier raised his hand and he said, I think Sophocles wrote the play to boost morale. And I was thrown for a loop. I said, well, what's morale boosting about watching a great warrior lose his best friend and come unglued and take his own? And before I could ask the question back, he shot back because it's the truth and because we're all sitting here shoulder to shoulder acknowledging it as a community. For me, that was a huge moment as a civilian, and this is played out in my book. Um, <laughs> you know, that tragedy itself actually could be a source of hope. Um, it's not the play that's the source of hope, it's the community coming together to face the darkest aspects of our humanity shoulder to shoulder, uh, to acknowledge these things. And so, um, uh, I'm going to use that as a segue just to shift to my second question, which speaks directly to, ma'am, what you just spoke about, which is the family. Ajax, uh, Sophocles says something really remarkable. He takes this mythologically insignificant figure, Tecmessa, and he puts her center stage, and he gives her almost as many lines as Ajax, and he makes it as much her story and her struggle as Ajax is. Now, he, she would have been played by a man, and it would have been an all-male audience, and it was a man writing her lines. So for our 21st century perspective, this is not, you know, uh, necessarily um, a, a, you know, a feminist act on his part, uh, but he brings that perspective into the center, and, he, and it really is about, I think, um, the collateral damage, the, the impact on the family, on the son. He gives her these lines, and I know many of you have been up for a long time, and your caffeine is fading, and your wine is starting to wane, so whatever's left of your serotonin, um, just give it to me for this question. It's my hardest question, and everything else is smooth sailing from this point in. Um, she says this. She says to the men, tell me, given the choice, which would you prefer? Happiness while your friends are in pain, or to share in their suffering? And the men say, well, twice the pain is twice as worse. And then she says, well, then we'll get sick while he recovers. And then she's, she's, they say, I don't understand the logic of your words. And here's what she says. This is what I want to ask you about. She says, in his madness, he took pleasure in the evil that possessed him, all the while afflicting those of us nearby. But now that the fever has broken, all of his pleasure has turned to pain. And yet we are still afflicted just as before. Twice the pain is twice the sorrow. 